Have you ever wondered how and why I CNC mill profiles like I do? It's a question that keeps you up at night, pondering the mysteries of the universe, I know. But fear not, this is your chance to understand the nooks and crannies of my mind. Well, maybe just my approach. By understanding how and why I CNC mill profiles this way, you'll gain a deeper appreciation for the level of precision and attention to detail that goes into my work. It's one of the most common questions I get, and while I have explained my reasoning more than a time or two, I think I can do just a bit better and provide an explanation that gives you more insight into how I came up with this process and why it's accurate, repeatable, and reliable. Okay, this is different from my typical talking point. Still, it's a big concern for many makers. If it's not apparent, I'm talking about time. We always try to save it. What you do with it once you get a bunch saved up, you'll have to figure that out on your own. I prefer to take a slower approach and thoroughly examine each aspect of the process to understand its impact on the final product. I will then make necessary adjustments including changing the order of operations and techniques to ensure the best possible outcome. I know many of you are charging to the finish line at full speed and for various reasons. Before getting into a rush to complete the project, take some time to plan the process. You'll be happier with the outcome and the time you're attempting to save won't go to waste. When it comes to dealing with tool pressure, it's important to understand that it's not just a physical battle. It can be a mental one too. There are steps you can take to alleviate the tension. With the right mindset and approach, you'll be able to overcome any tool-related challenge that comes your way. Unless you're talking about the pressure applied to the tool determined by the tool's dimensions, the feed rate, the depths of pass, and the width of a material cut in a ratio to the tool's diameter, then that's an entirely different thing. It's easy to imagine the forces involved in full engagement cutting compared to edge milling. The benefits and consequences of these methods are also easy to understand. When cutting with 50% less material, you can reduce the tool pressure and increase the feed rate. This allows for cleaner cuts, less finishing work, and reduced machining time. Chips are not trapped and recut and the margin of error when a jammed chip can destroy a part or even crash your machine is dramatically reduced. The tool engagement is dramatically decreased by rough cutting the profile on the bandsaw instead of slot milling, allowing for higher feed rates, less machine time, and a better surface finish. The chip extractor can more reliably extract chips that are not confined, and even if not cleared by the dust extraction, they are quickly thrown clear. Without slot milling, tabs are unnecessary, making finishing preparations more manageable and accurate with less sanding required. And less sanding is precisely what we want. At some point, you'll have to do it, but why not make it as easy as possible? I am frequently asked why I don't use indexing pins. And if I were making the same part or doing production work, I would use them. Doing what you see done in a manufacturing environment might not be the most effective method in your shop. It's good information, but use it according to your needs and the benefits it can provide. Test and validate these conclusions. If you're using indexing pins, you will need to apply both tabs and slot mailing. And my aversion to them runs deeper than you might think, and with good reason. Approaching your project with this mindset will improve your final product. There is another consideration, stock size. With my method, I can use smaller pieces of material, saving machining time and material costs, which is a notable concern for all of us.
The appeal of slot milling comes down to this point. If you use some indexing pin to establish the datum, then re-indexing is simple. All you need to do is flip the part and run. My method is a bit more complex, but it will teach you a skill that you will, without a doubt, need at some point. Let's face it, mistakes are going to happen. You're going to need to reset datums and find ways to get back to the point where the problem occurred and restart the milling. Unless your method is to start over again each time it happens, and in the beginning, it will be a lot. Who has the money to pour down the drain like that? Certainly not me. Learning to index and mill multiple setups this way will build a necessary skill and make you a much more capable machinist. Yes, I said machinist, and that's where I picked up these methods. They're all old school setup methods, and they work just as well today as they did in the past. Let's step through my process, and I'll explain what I'm doing why it works so well and how you can use it to get out of the trouble you will surely find yourself in. Create a center line on the part. I usually make two piece body blanks and I use the seam line as the center line. If this is unavailable, I'll draw a center line. I engrave a center line on my spoil board and align the stock center line with the body blank center line. I can index these center lines and the edge of the stock and cycle the drawing G code. With the outline drawn a quarter inch outside the final profile, I rough cut to this line on the bandsaw. The material can now be attached to the spoil board with the center line of the part aligned with the center line of the spoil board. I generally set the datum of my setups in Fusion 360 to a quarter inch more than the size of the final part. As I know this material is close to one quarter inch extra, I can index the first access, either X or Y, depending on how your machine is set up to the edge of the material. Zero the access, and then using MDI, I can add half the dimension of the tool. Like in the previous step, I index the second access from the center line. I can then set my Z coordinate. In my case, I set it at the top of the stock to ensure that I don't cut into the spoil board. I index at the spoil board, and then add 30 thousandths of an inch extra for the onion skin then MDI to the top dimension. This process will take up any error in stock dimension. Then I can finally run the profile milling code. It only takes one or two significant failures to be incredibly discouraging. And the level of detail required is intense initially. My advice is to take your time, not rush, and learn as much from the process as possible. The mistakes can be heartbreaking, and you will have them. It's part of the process. Do whatever it takes to find the root cause of these mistakes and develop a process around them, encapsulating your lessons learned and continuing your development. Over time, you will find methods like these and continuously improve your strategies and skills. We all want to make instruments, but ultimately we are making luthiers, machinists, and engineers. Keeping that in mind, will keep you engaged in the process and drive the art and science of this diverse craft continually forward. Making instruments with this kind of attention to detail is rewarding, but I wouldn't call it easy. When you're continually validating and testing your assumptions, you will improve, and along with your personal development, the parts you produce will exponentially increase in accuracy and quality. It's easy to get caught in the trap of trading time, and we all do it to some extent. Keeping your eyes on the prize and what that process is will keep you engaged and improving for many years. I'm sure there are elements I've missed, and if you feel the need to point them out, I'm happy to discuss it with you. If you like this kind of content, please subscribe, like, and share it with someone like-minded. It helps me out more than you might think. And thanks for watching.